Good day, friends. No matter where you're watching from or when you are watching, we are glad that you're here with us. And we hope that even though we are connected over the internet, we hope that you feel welcome as part of our worshiping community. Before we get started, I have a few announcements. One is that coming up very soon is our drive-by turkey supper. And if you are interested, it's $20 per ticket. You drive up to the church, somebody hands you a bag full of very good food that you can take home and eat in the safety of your own home. It's a turkey supper and it's going to be, if you are interested, phone the office. The information is down below the video. And this is a very important uh, way of supporting our church. Uh, our church here at St. Andrews, as well as I know so many individuals and companies and churches around the world, have really had a hard time this last year. And so I also want to offer those of you who have supported our ministries a big thank you. Uh, you have made a very difficult year just a little bit less difficult, and we very, very much appreciate it. If you are interested in supporting what we do here, be sure to look at that information down below because there is information there how you can easily donate to our church. Um, and the, the money will be put to good use. Uh, I'll show you here, I'll show you. This is the lighting that I use for our services every Sunday. And while this might just look like a Kleenex stuck to a desk lamp, oh no, my friends, that is not what that is. That is a two-ply cellulose filter that is attached with a self-adhesive membrane that from the name of it, I'm guessing must be imported from Scotland. That kind of, that kind of technology does not come cheap. So your donations are very much appreciated. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, you are holy with us. You wholly love us and wholly offer us a place at your table. We gather today in this virtual community of faith to offer you a place at our, in our lives. We accept what you offer and rejoice in your gifts. We thank you for the gift of the risen living Christ and ask that Christ rise in our hearts, inspiring, comforting, and transforming. We pray to you, who is our mother and our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn today is When Long Before Time. Thank you. 
the same for you, but different passages in the Bible mean different things to me. Some passages challenge or inspire. Some get me curious and make me want to dig deeper and do some research. Some can be pretty infuriating, sometimes just for what they say, and also infuriating because it seems that someone is going to take it out of context and use it as a weapon to divide us. And then there are some readings that are just like an old favorite sweater or a deep full-on hug from someone that you love. They're just so comfortable. Psalm 23 is one of those. No matter what, it seems like the right reading for the occasion. It's been read at births and deaths. It's been read at weddings. It's been cross-stitched onto endless pieces of fabric. I was told by a professor in university that one tool every minister should have in their tool belt is to have the 23rd Psalm memorized. And of course, memorized from the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Today in the church is known as Good Shepherd Sunday, and it focuses on Jesus as shepherd. And every year, this psalm is included in the readings. And no wonder. This reading is a celebration of God as the ultimate shepherd who keeps the flock safe and guides us faithfully. The image of a ruler as shepherd is pretty common in the Bible, but not always as favorably as in Psalm 23. Both Ezekiel and Isaiah talk of the religious and political leaders as miserable fa failures as shepherds, abandoning the sheep to the wolves feasting on the flock, and failing to lead them. Here, though, God is leading the author to God's own dwelling place. And it's a good thing, too, since this reading also has some pretty big challenges implied. It's easy to miss amongst the beautiful pastoral imagery, but this author is having a rough time. She's found himself in what they call the valley of death. Yes, the cup runs over and the table is prepared, but it's in the presence of enemies. This is a kind of reminder that faith in God is not a cure for trouble. There will still be good days and bad. But if we listen closely, we might just hear God's wisdom we just might hear a word of reassurance. Now, as I said, this is a comforting reading, and I don't want to mess with that, but there is one little bit of an issue that I'd like to take with the translations from King James and other versions. That one little bit where it says that goodness and mercy will follow me for the rest of my life, well, Translation is not an exact science, but I think it's probably more accurate to say, to translate from the original Hebrew, 
that goodness and mercy will pursue me for the rest of my life. It's a little bit of a different feel to it then, doesn't it? On the one hand, if it's being followed, here I am living my life and all the while, see that shadow there behind me? Yep, that's goodness and mercy. On the other hand, no matter what I do, no matter the mistakes I make or the trouble I get into, no matter how separated I feel from God because of the trouble in my life, goodness and mercy is chasing me down. God isn't giving up. There's a similar idea in the gospel reading from day, for today from the 10th chapter of John's version of the gospel. And this is Jesus speaking. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down on my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. Now here, I just wanna give you a little bit of context of, about this reading. This is actually a very, very long story that goes over a couple of chapters that starts with Jesus restoring the sight of a blind man. The man goes to the authorities to have his new sight certified, but they get all in a kerfuffle because, well, it's Jesus that's done it and he did it on the Sabbath. So yada, 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 trouble ensues. In the end, the authorities banish this man. Jesus hears what happens and Jesus tracks him down. This man is in trouble, but goodness and mercy pursues him and he is welcomed back into the fold. He is led through the valley of death to green pastures. And that is when Jesus goes into this metaphor of him being the good shepherd who gathers the sheep. He tends them. He lays down his life for them. In this particular passage, there's even this little odd addition of Jesus mentioning other sheep that know his voice, that belong to him but don't belong to the same sheepfold. Could this be a hint of the importance of spreading the good news to the Gentiles, the non-Jews who had already been gathering into the communities of Jesus' followers by the time John wrote this gospel? Now, I could be wrong here. Maybe I'm going a little bit too far because John was so very, and very obviously an all-in-for-Jesus kind of person. But this also sounds very much to me like a nod to other faith traditions that while not specifically following Jesus, really do live out what Jesus called the way of Christ, the way of compassion, the love for God and neighbor, the way of self-sacrifice for the good of others. Is that who listens to the voice of Jesus? but lives in other sheepfolds? Now, how do you feel about Jesus seeking you out, tracking you down, pursuing you? In some ways, I guess this could be a little bit troublesome. 
Yes, I maybe don't want Jesus tracking me down when I'm up to some nefarious deed. But more than that, at times in our lives when we encounter our, encounter our own valleys of death, I think we sometimes seek out confirmation of our low sense of self-worth. Sometimes we're not ready to seek out renewal and would rather just stay mired in the puddles of our own regrets and insecurities. To have Jesus always there, always ready to bring us back into the fold of God's love, means that sometimes having our own self sense of low self is challenged and that can be uncomfortable. It's like, the, it's like Christ is saying that we are worthy of goodness and mercy even when we don't believe it ourselves. And for me, at this time in history, with so much that is disjointed and strange, when we're separated from friends and family, and we can't even gather safely in our own churches to worship with our faith community, maybe it's nice to know that Jesus is still tracking us down. Now, saying that, don't worry. Because some of you I know are watching at home, coffee in hand, maybe still wearing your pajamas. I don't remember, though, Jesus ever worrying about dress code. That layer of flannel isn't going to shield you from the goodness and mercy that is tracking you down. And if you find yourself in a care home or a hospital, missing your family because they can't come to visit you? Well, hospital walls aren't going to hide you from Christ either. I don't expect this to make you miss your family any less, but I have faith that no matter what, Jesus is here and there. When we reach out our hands, even when no one else is there, Christ reaches out to take our hand, offering comfort. We are being chased down, and Christ is always there, ready for that moment when we agree to being caught. We are not alone. We live in God's world. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, 
giver of goodness and mercy, we gather into this odd community of people connected through internet and screen. We also, though, are connected through you, our one divine parent. We give thanks that you are here with us, no matter where we are, no matter where we are on the journey of life. You see through our insecurities and doubts. You call us out of our grudges and biases to walk by clear living waters. You use our doubts to build more resilient faith and call us to the rebirth demonstrated by Jesus. We give you thanks for your presence, your still speaking voice, and for your son, who always guides, provokes, and loves. We pray for ourselves as we continue to find ways to live with this pandemic. As is so often the case, crisis seems to bring out more fully what we already were. Those who practiced compassion are living out their care for those in need. Those who worshipped their own comforts before often continue to disregard the safety and needs of others. Those who spent life seeking knowledge and wisdom are finding so much more to learn. And those who sought the comfort of your presence may now be seeing you as a refuge in this wilderness. While so much of our behavior seems almost predetermined, we pray for your inspiration that we look to, this, to a hope of a post-pandemic world that has grown from our experience. As we see the good of scientific inquiry and expertise, let us more fully embrace learning and have the humility to trust those who know more than us. We've also seen who actually makes our lives more livable. We give thanks for the grocery store employees and the garbage collectors, for home care workers and doctors and nurses. We give thanks for teachers who are training the next generation on how to deal with the crises of tomorrow. As we pray our thanksgiving though, let us put these words into action and remember that these essential workers deserve respect. They deserve a livable income. We pray for those who struggle with health and while this pandemic is getting all the attention, let us also remember in our prayers all the other maladies which plague our siblings. We pray for those who suffer from poor mental health and those who are alone in hospital. We pray for those who are waiting for tests and procedures. We pray for those who suffer from loneliness and may they be aware of your presence, your outstretched hand, your still speaking voice. Holy One, Good Shepherd that guides us to still waters, we offer all these prayers to you with faith that you hear and that in your wisdom you answer. Amen. Our closing hymn today is These Things I Promise. Thank you. 
you feel that presence? Do you hear those steps behind you? Well, even if you don't, God is pursuing you and will never give up. We might as well just allow ourselves to be caught in God's embrace of goodness and mercy. Amen.